from the Bethel space of Europe to the borders of the Middle East to East Asia. The Soviet Union and the United States did battle for the supremacy of the world. Millions of pairs who inhabited the 20th century considered it a fight for the end of history. Both powers used every means at their disposal, including nuclear bombs, military espionage, finances, propaganda, cultural ties, and many more asymmetric tools. It is curious as to how human beings place themselves at such jeopardy not only with willingness but with anticipation. Neither side had an exclusive franchise on the calculated risks. Nearly everything the Americans and the Soviets designed had an art of dying but was an excuse for living. For this was the geopolitics of the Cold War. I'm your host Chiron and welcome to Caspian Report. The term Cold War was initially coined by the Germans to describe the arms race before World War I in Europe. However, the mainstream usage is often credited to British writer George Orwell, who used it in 1945. Even so, for most people the term war brings up disturbing acts of cruelties. The Cold War, however, was different. Not that it didn't have its share of brutality, because it certainly did. Mass murder, conspiracy, starvation, embargoes and much more were all too frequent occurrences. But still, the Cold War was distinct in the sense that it was an indirect conflict for global supremacy. And since that geopolitical struggle never came face to face, the Cold War never switched to the Hot War. One can assume that the latter would have involved the thermonuclear annihilation of humankind. Bernard Baruch, a financial advisor to Presidents Woodrow Wilson, and Franklin Roosevelt defined the Cold War in 1948 as a rivalry between two superpowers, which at the time was the United States and the Soviet Union, who each proceeded to fill the power vacuums left by the defeat of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. American and Soviet policymakers believed that they were forced to expand their political hegemonies to counter-maneuver the aggressive actions of the other, hence miscommunication, bluff, pride, personal and geopolitical ambitions, as well as good old-fashioned animosity between the two states, grew until the struggle became the Cold War. The fight between Moscow and Washington wasn't the usual show of bravado. The Cold War was a competition between two systems, the US versus the USSR, capitalism versus communism, pluralism versus totalitarianism. The American-Soviet struggle was present in the daily lives of people and shaped their identities and beliefs. From technology and espionage to business, sports and movies, nearly everything we hold dear today was formed by the Cold War. So in a way, by studying the past, we gain a better understanding of the present. Most historians agree that the Cold War took place between 1947 and 1991. Its origins, however, are much more profound and can be traced to the geographical pivot theory by historian Alfred Thayer Mahan, who wrote extensively on global politics. Mahan believed that whoever controlled the world's oceans would come to dominate global politics since most people live adjacent to the sea. The notion was that a powerful navy allows one to project power by the way of the sea onto the commercial maritime routes that connect the globe. That sounds eerily familiar to our present world. But as a naval officer, Mahan knew what he was talking about. And his work greatly influenced the behavior of military strategists and policymakers like Teddy Roosevelt and Franklin Roosevelt. For instance, Mahan's work encouraged the American government to purchase Alaska, annex Hawaii, construct a strong navy, and confront Spain in a war. In global terms, Mahan's book The Influence of Sea Power Upon History became mandatory reading in the German and French navies and even inspired the Japanese to fight the Russians in 1904. Considering his monumental impact, Mahan is often considered one of the most critical strategists in world history. Holding the opposite view was geographer Halford Mackinder, who argued that global power belonged to whoever controlled the heartland. 
Although he came a bit later than Mahan, Mackinder's work would also mold the minds of policymakers to come, and he is often considered the father of geopolitics as a field of study. In 1904, Mackinder wrote his most important thesis, the Heartland Theory, which divided the world in three bodies. The first was the World Island, which consisted of Europe, Asia and Africa. The second categorization refers to the offshore islands like the British Isles and the Japanese archipelago, while the final group points out to the Americas and Australia as outlying islands. Within these parameters, Mackinder placed a special emphasis on the world island. This was the most populous and resource-rich land combination. Whoever controlled the world island would gain the means to dominate the globe. Within the world island, however, was the heartland region, which stretched from the Volga to the Yangtze and from the Arctic to the Himalayas. This was the core domain of the world island power. Further dissecting the world island were the flat plains of Eastern Europe. The heartland power would most likely emerge from there. So any power seeking for global supremacy would need to start in the eastern part of the European continent. A summary of this theory comes down to the following passage. Who rules East Europe commands the heartland. Who rules the heartland commands the world island. Who rules the world island commands the world. Going by this theory, Mackinder explained international relations by observing how pivot islands were trying to conquer or at least prevent a singular power from dominating the heartland. This concept explains why Britain always fought against whoever tried to conquer continental Europe, like Napoleonic France, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. On the other hand, as an offshore island, Britain was destined to act as a regional police since the balance of power in Europe was vital for its independence. The timing of Mackinder's work, set prior to the two world wars against Germany, did not do his theory any favors. However, he was vindicated by the start of the Cold War, but for all the wrong reasons. Mackinder's forecast initially served as a warning for the European nations, but instead became the manifest destiny of the Soviet Union. Alexander Dugin, for instance, who is a modern political analyst with close ties to the Kremlin, has repeatedly written about the need for a Russian-based Eurasian power. In the late 19th and early 20th century, Mackinder's theory, especially the part concerning East Europe, became a source of inspiration for policymakers from Nazi Germany. Karl Hushofer, a politician and strategist from the Munich University, argued that Germany's national interest was to expand to the East. Haushofer believed that to command authority over East Europe and thereby pivot into the heartland, one had to control the eastern half of Europe as a collective unit, since the landmass was geographically defenseless and lacked barriers like mountains and rivers. As such, Haushofer sought to promote a German-Soviet alliance because their collective output would have overwhelmed the coastal powers such as France, the United Kingdom and the United States. Most analysts today would argue that there is merit to this claim. However, Haushofer's ideas took a turn to the dark side when Adolf Hitler took the cue and added it to his to-do list. Although Haushofer himself was not a member of the Nazi party, his work influenced the Nazi leadership and laid the bedrock for what would become known as the Lebensraum. This infamous expansionist policy sought to permanently remove the indigenous populations of Eastern Europe and repopulate the land with the German settlers, with the ultimate goal being to dominate the heartland region and from there the world island. Later, political scientist Nicholas Spikeman came along and merged the studies of Mackinder and Mahan. Spikeman argued that sea power alone was not enough for global dominance. He believed that whoever controlled the Eurasian landmass could come to dominate the world, but contended that to manage such a vast stretch of land, one would have to control the Rimland. Spikeman's Rimland referred to the coastal territory of Eurasia, which starts in southern Russia and northern China, and goes all the way down through Southeast Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, the Caucasus, until finally anchoring in Europe. For a singular power, this was an impossible area to dominate. 
and that is precisely what made it the perfect place for the leading sea power to contain the heartland power. So it's not surprising that Spikeman's theory was used to create the containment strategy that dominated the Cold War. Containment, however, was one thing, the total disintegration of the Soviet Union was an entirely different beast. This is where we enter the world of Polish statesman Józef Pilsudski. Living in between two expansionist powers, Germany and Russia, was not easy. Poland had to get creative. Its policymakers first aligned with France and Britain, but that didn't work. The second idea, however, was to unify all the nations in between Germany and Russia into a single federation under Polish leadership while at the same time supporting nationalist and secessionist movements within the Soviet Union to weaken it. This was the gist of Pilsudski's Prometheism concept. Although the initial project failed for its reasons, the geopolitical concept greatly inspired American policymakers. For instance, Zygmunt Brzezinski, who also happens to be of Polish descent, argued for the Balkanization of Russia an idea that was taken directly from Pilsudski. It should be noted though that all these geopolitical theories must be viewed at a specific time in history. For instance, Mahan could not have considered the technological advances such as long-range bombers, and Spikeman could not have included the role of intercontinental ballistic missiles or nuclear bombs in his Rimland theory. So even though these concepts remain relevant today, one must always consider the historical period of the studies. But what all these theories have in common is the constituency of geography. In other words, the Earth has domain over humankind, not vice versa. And just as it had been since the Athenian-Spartan face-off during the Peloponnesian War, sea power and land power were destined to clash. This time, however, the spectacle was not restricted to a remote area, but all the world became the stage. From a geopolitical angle, the Cold War was a testing ground for these theories, pitting the global naval power, the United States, against the Soviet Union, which controlled more land than any country. This clash would turn out to be the most epic international power struggle in history. It was essentially a game of chess on a global scale. The Americans sought to contain their Soviet counterparts wherever and whenever. Meanwhile, the Soviet leadership fought desperately to break out the containment by exporting its communist ideology. In the ensuing tug of war, alliances were made, governments were overthrown, and the international community was practically split in two. Underneath the disguise of ideology, the age-old geopolitical rules guided the contest. So when Putin says that the breakup of the Soviet Union was a disaster, he isn't referring to the collapse of communism, but the disintegration of the heartland concept. In this regard, one can argue that the grand chessboard of the Cold War still presents the template of modern, long-term global politics. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report, Special thanks to Alexander from Stauffenberg for helping me with this report. And of course, recognition also goes to our community on Patreon for providing us with the means to produce original content like this. If you enjoy our videos and want to support us, visit patreon.com slash report. You can join our community with all the perks for as low as a dollar a month. For now, take care and sahol.